This is the seventh screencast um, in the series on the nervous system. Just to remind you, normally we have three one hour lectures entitled nervous systems one, two and three. Uh, screencast one to three were associated with the nervous system one lecture, screencasts four, five and six with nervous system two and the next set of screencasts, probably seven, eight and nine will be associated with nervous system three lecture. So yeah, like I've done before, I'm just going to pause here to just to update you on the lecture aims that would have been associated with uh, lecture three. And so those are to understand the divisions of the peripheral nervous system. So we're going to have some screencasts on the autonomic nervous system and some on the somatic nervous system. I'll explain these as we go through. I'm going to explain a term called proprioception. Uh, then we're going to talk, as I said, uh, after talking about the autonomic nervous system, about the somatic or the motor nervous system to understand that the neuromuscular junction, the NMJ, is a specialised excitatory synapse and to understand the sequence of neuronal events at the neuromuscular junction that lead to something called excitation contraction coupling. So this is the release of a neurotransmitter that causes muscle contraction. And actually, um, maybe as the name suggests, this content is going to overlap with that of muscle physiology. So in the final screencast, we'll tell you about the neuronal side of the neuromuscular junction, but then in the next set of screencasts about muscle physiology, we'll pick up about the neuromuscular junction. So make sure that you look, um, as with all lectures, um, at both the content of um, complementary lectures, if you like. So some of the lectures about the neuromuscular junction obviously are going to focus on the neuronal side. Some are going to uh, focus on the muscular side. If you do get a question in the examination, make sure that you include appropriate information from all lectures. Uh, again, this maybe is a placeholder slide. Um, this is officially the fourth um, uh, section that we're going to talk about in these three lectures, and it's on the autonomic nervous system. So in the scheme of things, we've already talked about the central nervous system in the previous screencasts. And we're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system in this screencast um, and then the somatic nervous system probably in the next uh, couple of screencasts. We'll see how we get on. So really some background information about the autonomic nervous system. So what does autonomic mean? Well, autonomic actually means automatic. So when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, you'll see as we go through the next few slides, there are things that we do automatically. So I'm sitting here and talking to you. Um, I'm not really thinking um, about how my breathing is going on. I'm not thinking about digestion. I'm not thinking about my blood pressure. All of these things are um, mediated by the autonomic or the automatic nervous system. Um, so the, the autonomic nervous system, as we're going to see in the next few slides, can be split into two main sections, um, the, sympathetic, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. There's also a third system called the enteric nervous system. So if you look in some textbooks, um, as well as dividing the autonomic nervous system into the two main um, systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. They also include the enteric nervous system and we'll include that for completeness. But really we're going to focus on the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, because it's a nervous system, it has outputs from different parts of the spinal cord essentially. Um, the spinal cord can be divided up into regions including the cranial, the sacral, the thoracic and the lumbar. Um, we'll hear about this in other parts of the course and there's a diagram on the next slide that hopefully make this a little bit clearer. The parasympathetic arises from these regions, the cranial region and the sacral region. They synapse, uh, make contacts at ganglia, groups of nerve cells close to the tissue that is innervated. So close to the tissue that has the nerve supply. By contrast, the sympathetic nervous system arises from two different regions, the thoracic and the lumbar region they synapse at ganglia either side of the vertebral column. And again, this will become clearer on the next slide. Ganglia are further away or distal to the tissue that's innervated. And again, for completeness, the enteric nervous system is part of the gut. So if you see this term enteric, it means to do with the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, and the organs are associated with the GI tract, things like the pancreas and the gallbladder. Again, we've got a couple of slides on that. Um, I'll show you those um, after we've considered the autonomic nervous system. 
so yeah, like I said, if you didn't really understand some of those uh, terminologies or you just need a little bit more information, um, this is the cranial and this is the sacral region. You can see the parasympathetic shown here on the right um, arises from these areas. Um, and actually in this diagram, it's a little bit more um, accurate because the cranial region uh, has this medulla region above it. And you can see that some of the outputs or many of the outputs of the parasympathetic nervous system more correctly arise from this medulla. But essentially this cranial medulla region can be thought of as, as the same region for the outputs of the parasympathetic nervous system. By contrast, the sympathetic nervous system shown over here on the left arises from these thoracic and lumbar region. And this is this um, vertebral sympathetic uh, chain that we mentioned on the previous slide. So um, this vertebral column sympathetic chain is basically this region here and it, the parasympathetic nervous system synapses um, in this um, paravertebral sympathetic chain to start with and then supplies the innervated tissue. So when we're talking about the innervated tissue here we're saying the heart is supplied by nerves, so it's innervated, the lungs are innervated, the adrenal medulla. Um, and again, what we should see, as I said previously, um, the groups of nerve cells are close to the innervated tissue for the parasympathetic nervous system. This is meant to indicate that they're close, um, whereas they're further away, they're more distal from the innervated tissue in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, these red fibers are called preganglionic because they're before the ganglia, these black dots here, these groups of nerve cells, these are the ganglia, and these purple um, um, labels here are what we call post-ganglionic fibres. So what we should see, and we'll see this on the next few slides, it's probably the synapses here where the post-ganglionic fibres innervate the actual tissue um, here as well in the sympathetic nervous system that are the most important. So if we and put an agent that interferes with synapses here, it's going to have direct effects on the heart, the lungs, the liver, etc. Uh, heart, lungs, bladder, genitalia, whatever. So it's these postganglionic fibres that are important in terms of the transmitter that's released and the receptors that it acts on. Um, maybe just to put into, um, give you a little bit more information, the autonomic nervous system is said to be a visceral system. So viscera, um, uh, really um, is a word that describes the organs in the body and maybe the gut as well. It's a largely involuntary motor system. So as I said, we're not constantly thinking about things like our heartbeat, uh, smooth muscle contraction, grand, uh, gland secretions um, and metabolism. These are all done automatically by the autonomic nervous system. In general, so these are some terms that you may have heard about, maybe if you did A-level biology, uh, the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is said to evoke a fight and flight response, uh, while the parasympathetic uh, mediates a rest and digest state. So what does this mean? Well, I, I guess in evolution, the sympathetic nervous system is something that decided whether we would attack a prey and uh, overpower it and eat it or if it was bigger than us we would run away from it so the sympathetic nervous system evokes energy in either to in in order to either um, attack and kill um, um, a prey so that we can survive or run away from it if it's dangerous conversely the parasympathetic nervous system is um, evoked after we've uh, eaten a prey if you like so it mediates a rest and digest state. So when we've uh, eaten a meal, um, the parasympathetic nervous kicks in to help us to digest the meal. And also the parasympathetic nervous system is predominant um, when we want to rest, when we want to go to sleep. So it slows down the heart, for example, um, instead of um, pumping blood around the body to let us uh, fight or run away from something. Again, hopefully we'll see this um, in, in this table here. These are some uh, actions of the sympathetic nervous system and these are the ones um, and these are actions in the parasympathetic nervous system. So these um, types of physiological action tend to be 
ones that are associated with increasing energy, if you like. So um, maybe some examples here. Um, the lungs will dilate the lungs so we can get more air around the body. Heart, in particular, the rate and force of crack contraction increases if we want to fight something or run away from it. Conversely, the parasympathetic, the rate decreases, maybe when we're at rest and we get increased secretions. Um, also here from um, the upper GI tract because we want to um, we want to um, metabolize the food away. We want to break the food down. We want to get energy from the food in the parasympathetic system. Maybe one thing just to point out here is although that the actions are op often opposite to each other, we shouldn't think of these as opposite systems. We should think of them as systems that work in concert with each other. If they were simply opposite, then the parasympathetic nervous system here, for example, would um, reduce the release of epinephrine in the adrenal medulla, but it doesn't, there's no corresponding effect. So think of these as complementary systems. And again, maybe just, this is a good point to tell you that epinephrine, if you see that written in some textbooks, it's the same compound as adrenaline. So adrenaline can also be called epinephrine, noradrenaline can also be called norepinephrine. So as we said, maybe just a little bit more detail here, these preganglionic fibres, which we showed you on the previous slide, are these ones in red, and the postganglionic fibres are the ones that come after the ganglia, so pre and postganglionic. Those are the ones that are important in the transmitters and the receptors that we use. So preganglionic fibres arise from the central nervous system, synapse onto postganglionic fibres, the postganglionic neurons terminate at the effector, as we showed you on that previous diagram. There are two important neurotransmitters. We talked about neurotransmitters in one of the earlier screencasts. The two main important uh, neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, is associated with the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. Noradrenaline, sometimes metabolized to adrenaline, is associated with sympathetic nervous system. So because of that, um, uh, in the parasympathetic nervous system, we talk about cholinergic transmission because it's associated with acetylcholine. In the sympathetic nervous system, we talk about noradrenergic or adrenergic transmission because noradrenaline and adrenaline are the main transmitters. Again, this will hopefully become clear as we go through the slides. Um, again, maybe this is a, is a useful slide and it's a slide that I'm going to probably show you several times. It really summarises the differences between the main branches of the parasympathetic, uh, sorry, of the peripheral nervous system, namely the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, those are the ones that we're going to concentrate on in um, the next couple of slides. So we're going to concentrate on sympathetic and parasympathetic. But really, again, just to sh um, to also tell you that the somatic nervous system is the other main division of the peripheral nervous system, and we'll talk about that in the probably the final couple of screencasts. Why I like to show this slide is because it gives you an indication of some of the neuro neurotransmitters and some of the receptors that are involved. So in the sympathetic nervous system, noradrenaline is the main um, transmitter involved because it acts on these postganglionic fibers. In the parasympathetic nervous system, it's mainly acetylcholine. Acetylcholine can work at two different types of receptors, muscarinic and nicotinic. So we'll see that the muscarinic receptor is the most important in the parasympathetic nervous system because it's present at the end of the chain at the postganglionic effector, if you like. So acetylcholine acting on muscarinic receptors is important in the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, what we'll also see is acetylcholine acts on these other types of receptors, the nicotinic receptors at these preganglionic fibres. And again, what, we, what was useful to point out here is that if we want to manipulate this system, um, if we have an agent, let's say, that blocks a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, that's not going to distinguish very well, or at all in fact, between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Because if we've got a blocker, it's going to block here, so it's going to block sympathetic effects, but it's also going to block here. So it's going to also block parasympathetic effects. So we can't distinguish between the two systems. If we want to distinguish between the systems, we could have something that blocked the receptors that, that noradrenaline acts on, the adrenergic receptors, or we could have something that blocks 
muscarinic receptors. So something that blocks these receptors will block the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, these physiological effects. Something that blocks a muscarinic receptor will selectively block these parasympathetic effects. And again, maybe just for completeness, there's a different type of nicotinic receptor that's present at skeletal muscle at the neuromuscular junction. Again, we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail as we go through the next few screencasts. So let's focus on sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, systems uh, just uh, for now and detail some of the receptors that are involved. So this is an important take home message. Sympathetic effects are largely due to noradrenaline, react, noradrenaline action and they act on these two types of receptors, alpha and beta adrenoceptors. And again, we'll hear about more about alpha and beta adrenoceptors as we go through the course. Sympathetic effects are fight and flight. So as I maybe said on that previous slide, if we want to um, excite a system, we'll use the sympath we'll use or if we want to um, produce energy, if you like, um, we'll activate things like uh, the heart in terms of increasing the rate and force of contraction. We'll direct blood flow to skeletal muscles so that we can um, maybe run away from a prey or attack a prey and um, maybe we'll release adrenaline in order to um, kick the sympathetic nervous system into action. Conversely, the parasympathetic effects, as we've said, are largely due to acetylcholine action. And because the muscarinic receptors are found at these postganglionic fibers, then these are the most important um, receptors in the parasympathetic nervous system. For completeness, acetylcholine acts on a different subtype of acetylcholine receptor, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in the somatic nervous system. Parasympathetic effects, um, again, maybe just uh, for completeness. Now we don't want to increase the rate and force of the heart. We want it to decrease um, or the decrease. We want the rate to decrease. The force is unaffected actually by the parasympathetic nervous system, as it says here. Um, we want to direct blood not to the skeletal muscles like in the sympathetic nervous system, but maybe to the gut, to the viscera. So this is going to be important if we want to digest food and take the energy to the places where we need it. Uh, or yeah, um, yeah, blood flow directed to the viscera so we can digest food essentially. So let's just finish on the last couple of slides for completeness just to tell you what the enteric nervous system is. As I said, some um, textbooks classify the enteric nervous system as part of the autonomic nervous system. There are two main groups of uh, nerve, nerve nets or plexuses, plexi. Um, one is called the myenteric plexus, one is called the submucosal plexus, and these were named after neurophysiologists who originally described these um, nerve nets, if you like, so Albach and Meisner. So the myenteric plexus or the Albach's plexus, Al Albach's plexus is the same thing, the submucosa or the Meisner's uh, plexus. You can see that they are present in different um, muscle layers. Um, Again, maybe it's easy just to show you this on a diagram, um, which I'll do on the next slide, but the enteric nervous system can function by itself. That's why it's maybe considered sometimes as part of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and maybe the, the, the best reason that we consider it part of the autonomic nervous system is that it is regulated in some ways by both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. This is a diagram just really to show you where the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus are. Um, again, we'll talk more about the enteric nervous system perhaps in other parts of the course. So this is um, uh, a summary slide. Um, have a read through that. Um, so the autonomic nervous system is visceral. It's associated with the gut. It's involuntary. We're not thinking about our blood pressure. Um, we're not thinking about controlling our heart rate. It controls muscle, so this is important as well. We'll talk about muscle physiology in the next set of screencasts, but this is really just to mark your card for that. The pathways are said to be bisynaptic. So when I showed you this preganglionic and the postganglionic neurons, that means there's two pathways, so they're bisynaptic. Postganglionic neurons may be excitatory or inhibitory. 
Um, sympathetic nervous system is dominant in emergency situations when we require energy, so a fight and flight situation. Conversely, the parasympathetic nervous system mediates this rest and digest state, and the characteristics of both of these are shown here. You can read that for yourself. The enteric nervous system controls the activity of the gastrointestinal tract and the associated glands and organs, so things like the, um, the gallbladder and the pancreas, which we showed you on the previous slide. OK, um, that's a good place to finish the first screencast. Um, we'll, we'll go on to talk about the physiology of motor systems in uh, screencasts eight and nine.